There's treasures in space, including the asteroid belt. That a bunch of pebbles got together and poof, there was an asteroid the size of Rhode Island. Well, that doesn't work. If you add up all the mass of the asteroids, you really wouldn't get a planet, you'd get a bigger asteroid. We're telling stories rather than constructing scientific models. The rate of meteor impacts we think was much greater in the past. Comets should no longer exist. We still see them, so where are they coming from? The fact is there are comets. They're disappearing before our very eyes, young Earth indicators. As a Christian, I don't have any worries about the future of the world because I know who holds the future when it comes to that. When we think of our solar system, we think of the Earth and other planets orbiting the Sun. But did you know that there are hundreds of other celestial bodies that travel about our system? These include asteroids and comets. Many have theorized that these are leftovers from the natural formation of our solar system. But could they point instead back to a creator? So asteroids are a really interesting part of the solar system, especially as it pertains to the origins discussion. Because what is an asteroid, first of all? Well, it's basically a big rock flying through space. They tend to be found in certain places and not found in other places. And they come in different sizes and shapes, and some of them are even big enough to have enough gravity to pull themselves into a round shape. Some people even proposed calling them small planets. An asteroid basically is a minor planet. It's something that is like a planet, it orbits the sun directly, but it's too small to be considered a true planet. The first asteroids that discovered were originally classified as planets. Ceres, Vesta, Pallas, Juno. There were four extra planets in our solar system at one point. When astronomers kept discovering these, and when they found that they were very small, too small to see a disk, at least in the telescopes at that time, they decided, you know what, these are all really a new class of object. They had very similar orbits, all in between Mars and Jupiter. Most asteroids orbit in between Mars and Jupiter and so they gave them a new classification. So Pluto was not the first planet to be ejected with that status. It's just with Pluto, it was a planet for over 70 years before it was downgraded. Well, the asteroids are a special category of space rocks which orbit the Sun, and they're between the orbits mainly of Mars and Jupiter, so they're out further beyond us. And they're strung out all the way around the Sun like a large ring, like a path of these objects. There's hundreds of thousands of them. Many of them would be the size of a house or the size of your car. And some creationists wonder whether or not they're fragments from an exploding small planet. And many of them appear to be very metallic. Other ones are more frothy and just more sponge-like, so there's quite a variety of them. And to think about this, the large ones that are metallic whether they're made out of pure iron or nickel or whatever, they'd be very valuable. So there's some thoughts in years to come of somehow capturing these and hauling them home if that could be done. There's a lot of resources. There's treasures in space, including the asteroid belt. These treasures are not the only objects traveling around our solar system. As it turns out, there's lots of space rocks and it seems that there's a lot of confusion as to what they're called. A meteoroid would just be a small object in space anywhere around the solar system. That's just a generic name for a rock, large or small. You have a particle, a pebble or something that enters Earth's atmosphere, that's a meteoroid. What you see is a meteor. A meteor is the light emitted from the meteoroid, and if it hits, which only one in a billion do, if it hits, the object is classified as a meteorite. So a meteoroid is the object when it's traveling through the air, meteorite when it hits, and the meteor is what you see. There's several categories of meteorites. The main two, there are stony type and metal types. The stony ones, they look like a stone, kind of like a conglomerate. There's a combination of different minerals that have been cemented together. And then the metallic ones very much look like metal. They're mainly iron and nickel. 
the ones that we find on the ground, some are palm size, some are larger than a car, or even larger yet, weighing several tons. When something like that hits the ground, then there's a massive explosion and it makes the news. And we do have a few craters on Earth where impressive ones have hit, like in northern Arizona, it's called the Behringer Crater. That crater's a mile across. That was a large meteorite that struck the ground at some point in the past. Impact craters come from chunks of space rock that survived traveling through our atmosphere to be hurled against the ground. In a biblical worldview, where did they originally come from? Could they be leftovers from collisions in space that have been occurring ever since God created? Or did he make them just as they are? We don't see asteroids form. Occasionally they're lost because some of them cross orbits. And so every now and then an asteroid, a smaller one, will, will cross into Earth's orbit and become a meteoroid and then a meteorite. And so that happens sometimes. But we don't see new ones being created or forming. Some people have asked if asteroids are part of the original creation or if they're an exploded planet or something like that. If you add up all the mass of the asteroids, you really wouldn't get a planet, you'd get a bigger asteroid. There's not much in terms of mass there. I think a lot of times people think, when they think of the asteroid belt, they think of something like on the Empire Strikes Back with all these very, you know, they're just real close together. If you were standing on one asteroid, you probably would not notice any others. They're widely separated compared to the size of them. They're not real dense like you'd see. There are a few thousand of them that orbit, but they have a lot of space in which to orbit. Now whether that was created and just there since day number four, Maybe some former planet had a collision and was knocked to pieces to form this asteroid belt. We don't know. There's lots of speculation, even in the young Earth view on the history of the solar system. There's a common belief among uh, creationists that there was a planet that blew up or had a collision or something. Maybe asteroids were introduced then at the time of the flood or the fall, or perhaps asteroids themselves came in at that point. But I think this again gets back to the question of what does it mean the creation was very good? I don't have a problem with a very good creation having asteroids and comets. I think people are maybe trying to read too much into what that very good implies and trying to box it in more with perfection and their perception of what perfection is. I think they probably are part of the original creation. I'm not sure what their purpose is. I really don't know. It could be that God maybe uses those in judgment. He put them there so that he could just bring one down on the earth when he needs to. If he wants to judge people that way, he can certainly do that. They're interesting, they're just part of the solar system, they tell us something about the laws of physics and so on. Ultimately, God does what he does, and sometimes we don't know why he does what he does. Since secular astronomers deny the biblical account of creation, they theorize that planets like Earth were made when dust and rocks were attracted together through gravity. They believe modern day asteroids are leftovers from the early solar system, and they've been flying around ever since. The question is, where did these things come from? Most of us don't think to ask that question, of course, but this turns out to be a very important question when it comes to origins. The secular model, I should say the currently most popular secular model for the origin of the solar system is the solar nebula model. The idea that there was, in the beginning, there was this big cloud of gas and dust that eventually started a swirl and collapsed on into a disk shape. And then the gas condensed into dust and the dust stuck together to become little rocks and the little rocks stuck together to become bigger rocks and bigger rocks stuck together to become planetesimals, it's called, or asteroids. And these are supposed to be the building blocks from the planets. In the secular view, asteroids are a planet that didn't make it, that never formed. You see, in the secular view, particles come together and accrete and form bigger and bigger planets. And my secular colleagues would say that a planet would have formed in between Mars and Jupiter, except Jupiter's gravity is enough to disturb it to the point where it could never accumulate, where it could never accrete into a planet. So many would say that the asteroids that we see today are just the leftover building blocks from early in the history of the solar system. These are the ones that never got it together to make planets. It's interesting though because when you really dig into this model, asteroid formation is a very important part of the secular model for the solar system. It's the building block for all the planets. Without asteroids you don't get planets. It turns out from this disk of gas and dust you don't get asteroids. You can get the dust and you can get little pebbles, 
But getting from pebbles to large enough rocks to build things with, there's a tremendous gap in the model. It was initially thought to be simple. I mean, you just keep banging rocks together till they get bigger and bigger. Now that the models are getting more sophisticated, we're finding that this doesn't work. Beyond a certain size, the rocks start breaking each other apart in collisions, and it's a destructive process. Rather than constructing things, we're destroying things instead. So some modelers are going so far to say now, as the building blocks came in these large jumps, that a bunch of pebbles got together and poof, there was an asteroid the size of Rhode Island. Well, that doesn't work. That's just a way of covering up the fact that the model has a major problem in it. My secular colleagues love asteroids because they try to use them to sweep away the evidence for a young solar system or a well-designed solar system or all these different properties of the solar system that make perfect sense in creation and they don't make sense in a secular view. The answer is almost always an asteroid. The tilt of the planets, for example, you expect all the planets really ought to be tilted the same way if the secular scenario were true and we find that very few of them are. Very few of them are just exactly tilted right, and the answer is always, well, something must have whacked it off the axis, and they think, well, the big asteroid must have done that. So uh, giant impacts, that's the thing in the modern literature is to invoke an asteroid for almost everything that doesn't make sense. Another example of this is with the planet Mars. For various reasons, secular models want Mars to have had a history of liquid water on its surface. The problem is Mars's atmosphere is very thin. So the boiling point of water is very low, and so liquid water wouldn't last very long on the surface. It would boil away very quickly. But secular models want there to be a deep ocean on Mars in some places. Thus, they need a thicker atmosphere. So most secular modelers would say that Mars did used to have a much thicker atmosphere. Well, why don't we see that today? Well, because an asteroid came and plowed into Mars and disrupted it in such a way that it lost its atmosphere. Asteroids are invoked quite a bit to kill dinosaurs, for change the rotation of a planet, to all sorts of things that invoked, and, and there's so many of them out there. The origin of the moon, they're leftover material and you can't say that it didn't happen because you don't have any evidence it did or it didn't happen sort of thing. It's a past event, but yeah, it's a very handy rescuing device. I think asteroids are probably the most common rescuing device in the solar system for fixing things and solving problems. And asteroids tend to be used as sort of a magic bullet to explain all these problems away. As an example, Mercury is too dense. A planet in its position in the solar system of its size shouldn't be the density that it is. So what's the solution? Well, apparently it formed at the density that the secular model would expect, but then an asteroid plowed into it, broke it up, and of all the various pieces, all of the lighter ones went away into space somewhere, never to return. All the heavier ones then gathered together into the planet that we see today. Well, where's the evidence for the collision? Well, the evidence is that otherwise Mercury is a problem for the secular model. I don't think that's a good standard of evidence. Venus. Venus doesn't have a moon. But Venus is supposed to be Earth's sister planet. It's roughly the same volume and same mass, and it's next to us in the solar system. And it's supposedly formed at the same time, in the same place, in the same materials, using the same natural processes. It should be very similar to Earth in its major characteristics, and it is, except that it doesn't have a moon. Why not? If Earth got one, why didn't Venus get one? Well, some people have proposed Venus did actually get one, as you might expect. Well, we don't see one today. Where did it go? Well, an asteroid hit it, broke it up, it's gone. The Earth's moon. Where did the Earth's moon come from? Because it couldn't have formed the way it was, according to the models. Well, the usual explanation now is the Earth formed by itself, and then something pl plowed along, hit the, hit the Earth, sprayed out a bunch of material. There's the moon. There's an asteroid being evoked again. The planet Uranus. Very interesting planet. It's hard to tell by looking at it because it's sort of featureless, but we found out that unlike other planets, Uranus is tilted over on its side. So whereas other planets spin like tops as they orbit the sun, Uranus being sideways rolls along like a ball. Well, the secular model says Uranus couldn't have formed that way. So what's the answer? Well, big asteroid hit it, knocked it over after it formed the correct way as a secular model requires. Well, this invokes other problems too because Uranus has a system of moons that orbits its equator in the perpendicular position, perpendicular to the plane of the ecliptic. How could a collision have knocked it over without disrupting the moons? Well, the answer now, which is just proposed recently, is there was two collisions that produced it and that produced the moons and so on. So over and over again, we're seeing asteroids being invoked to explain away various problems that the model has. So, but where is the evidence for these events occurring? These are events that, if they occurred, occurred far in the past and we don't observe them happening today. So now we're invoking scenarios and really we're telling stories rather than constructing scientific models. And this is something that I think gets glossed over a lot in this discussion.
While secular scientists use asteroids to solve problems for their origin model, there are legitimate questions about the influence they've had on our solar system. For example, most of the planets and moons have heavy cratering across their surfaces. Did those come from asteroids, or is there another explanation? Uh, lately, I've been spending a lot of time looking at impact craters. We have uh, craters on the moon. That's been known for 400 years since Galileo, four centuries ago, did it. But in 1965, I think it was, we got the first reconnaissance of the surface of Mars up close and saw craters. We now have craters on Mercury, Venus, the satellites of the outer planets. About the only body in the solar system that doesn't have any craters on it is EO, the innermost uh, large satellite of Jupiter. And that's because it's being continually reworked with volcanoes on the surface. The Earth doesn't have very many either. And so we've been having an increasing discussion in creation circles. It's been increasing over the last 15 years or so, talking more and more about craters. We think most of them are from impacts. And the question is, where did the impacts come from? And we've really divided into two schools. There is one school of thought that they happen to believe that most of the craters happened at the time of the flood or shortly thereafter. The idea that a lot of impacts bodies happened on the, on the Earth and around the solar system. What's driving that is the fact that we believe that most of the fossil bearing strata around the world happened during or shortly after the flood, very short duration, not over millions of years like evolutionists think. And we find in the fossil record a number of structures that look like impact craters. And so if your stuff is laid down in over a few months or a year or so, then it seems to suggest very strongly that those impacts occurred at the time of the flood. The rate of meteor impacts we think was much greater in the past. It had to be because right now very few objects hit the moon or even the earth really in terms of big ones. Very, very few. And yet there are all kinds of craters all over the moon. And so we know that the rate must have been much quicker in the past, perhaps during the creation week, maybe during the flood. Uh, by the way, even secularists will have to in say that the rate was greater in the past because even on their view, even in their time scale, in the 4.5 billion years of the solar system, there hasn't been enough time at today's rates to get all the craters that you find on the moon. Either way, the rate must have been greater in the past. I take a different view. I think many of the craters in the solar system, including on the moons, were formed on the day four creation event. Remember I pointed out earlier, I believe that uh, God made them. Uh, out of material he had created on day one, and he brought them together, fashioned them, and you know, when he got finished, the surfaces of those bodies had to look like something. And I don't think they're perfectly smooth. I think maybe bore some record of how he put these things together. So you end up with some craters, I think, to start with. And then at the time of the flood, there was some bodies that came into the uh, solar system. I think particularly the Earth was hit and the moon was, we'd say in military terms, collateral damage less so for some of the other things in the solar system. I don't think creationists have spent a lot of time talking and writing and thinking about craters, but it's increasingly so we're starting to talk about it. And we even have a couple different models out there now. <laughs> so we do believe their impacts, that they actually bear testament to some sort of event in the past. Exactly when they happen is up for dispute at this point. Mike Ord and I are friends, good friends actually, and we both agree that there were impacts associated with the flood because we see uh, again, in the fossil record, these impacts uh, was actually first suggested by Wayne Spencer and a few other people several years before, but Mike's really gotten into this big time. We also see evidence of some big impacts on the moon, particularly. I respectfully disagree with Mike. He, he wants to put it all at the time of the flood, and I want to divide it between day four creation of the flood. I think some of the big impacts were probably late the time of the flood. So Mike and I agree on a lot, but then we disagree on a few particulars. And I like that rough and tumble of discussion. That's what scientists do, and why should creation scientists be any different? Since we see impact craters all around the solar system, could we be in danger? If someone believes in a random origin of the universe, then why couldn't there be a time when a deadly asteroid could hit the Earth? However, if you believe in an all-powerful God who has a plan for creation, then there is no real need for concern. Most asteroids orbit in between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. Some that cross into Mars's orbit and some that cross even further into Earth's orbit and a handful that go even further, like into Mercury's orbit, something like that. Fortunately, there's very few that cross that way. 
and most of them are in such a position that when they're crossing Earth's orbit, Earth isn't there. Uh, just because they cross Earth's distance, too, doesn't mean they ever actually intersect Earth's orbit because they could be in slightly different planes. Now, the asteroids are roughly in the same plane as the planets, but not exactly. They can quite easily miss the Earth many times. The Earth does have impact craters on it where some of the smaller asteroids have been obliterated as they impacted the Earth. On the surface of the Earth, there are a few craters here and there, not very big ones, by the way. There are some older ones that are found, one up in Canada that's a ring-shaped uh, lake on a reservoir. There are several others that have been glaciated. There's one in northern Indiana I've driven across many times, never saw it. It's just a shocked uh, structure beneath the surface of the ground. Uh, we have one in Arizona that's a mile across, 600 feet deep. I've been there several times, and uh, that's a catastrophic uh, thing that happened. I would have loved to have seen that from a distance, a very safe distance. I think they've identified a couple hundred of these fossil, or they call them astroblems, and I think there's another term for some of them, but these are uh, craters. Now, now, some of them have not been completely verified by everybody, to everybody's satisfaction, but we're getting the sense that there are at least a couple hundred, probably, that have hit the Earth we know of. There's some question as to how many have hit in the past. We don't really know how many have hit. It's sort of interesting because the Moon has all these craters all over its surface, and the Earth has very few by comparison. And you'd think if they both formed the same way, you'd expect the Earth to have a lot more craters because it's bigger. It's, it's got a bigger cross-section in space, and it's got much greater gravity than the Moon, much greater. You'd expect that it would accumulate a lot more craters. They're not there. And that's very interesting. Some of that can be explained by plate tectonics. You could say, well, maybe they were there, and then the plate tectonics uh, covered them up. And that's a secular explanation. But in the biblical worldview, maybe there just haven't been that many that hit Earth. Maybe the craters on the moon were from its process of God creating it, taking previous material, and the Earth was made in a different way. It was made on the first day. Everything else made on the fourth day. Could be a reflection of the different process of creation that God used. If you're worried about long-term survivability of man and, and, and an evolutionary worldview, the chances are eventually our world will literally and figuratively end when a big impact hits. And it will happen again. You know, suppose the dinosaurs were killed off 65 million years ago the same way. In Russia, we had a big thing that streaked in and dropped some pieces, blew up some stuff, didn't kill anybody, as I recall, injured some people, and it tore up windows and things. It was a, quite a sight. If you had something a few miles across come in, it could conceivably end civilization. If it landed in the oceans, it would have a huge tsunami. It makes everything else look small by comparison. Hit on a continent, it would probably kill everybody on that continent. And it would set back civilization. And people have written scenarios on this. So right now, we have a program looking for crossing asteroids. Yeah, there are certain astronomers that specialize in tracking asteroids, mainly to make sure that they don't uh, impact Earth. There's few asteroids that are in Earth-crossing orbits, and there's a science to that, and it's complex. Even the rotation of the asteroid matters. I read an article not long ago that said we're safe from this one because it's rotating in a particular way. Had it been rotating this way, it might be a problem because there's a very subtle force as the asteroid absorbs sunlight and then re-radiates out in space. That produces a very slight pressure, and over the course of time, that can alter its orbit ever so slightly. They're actually able to predict these things, believe it or not, and they now know that that's not likely to impact Earth anytime soon. From a creationary viewpoint, that's not going to happen. It's, you know, God is going to protect this world, and, and the world will end when He decides that it will, and it won't take an asteroid to do that. It will take merely His saying so to do it. So God is in control, and as a creationist, as a Christian, I don't have any worries about the future of the world because I know who holds the future when it comes to that. And the Lord is entirely and sovereignly in control of the world, and it's, nothing's going to happen that's going to surprise Him. I'm glad that we have astronomers out there looking at that stuff, and they've confirmed that there's no chance of being hit by any major asteroid, any Earth-destroying asteroid, at least within our lifetimes. There have been several major asteroid impacts on Earth throughout history. The latest was an asteroid impact thought by secular scientists to have happened 66 million years ago, ending the rule of the dinosaurs. Challenges to this idea have recently raised doubt of the asteroid and the extinction of the dinosaurs, but it is still a very popular theory. Secularists have even used uh, asteroids to account for the demise of the dinosaurs in their view. I would argue that's more readily explained in light of the biblical flood 
Of course, dinosaurs would have been preserved on Noah's Ark. The environment was very different, we think, after the flood, and that could have led gradually to their extinction. In any case, my uh, secular colleagues, some of them, say that, that an asteroid impacted the Earth and, and it threw out clouds and such and changed the Earth's environment such that the dinosaurs were wiped out by that. There are a number of problems with that explanation. One of the evidences that they use for it is a layer of iridium that's found what they call the KT boundary, and you find dinosaurs below that layer and not above. And iridium is something that's present in asteroids and meteorites. And so they think, well, there you go. See, it, it crashed and it threw up all that iridium into the atmosphere and it settled down, and, and that's why you don't find dinosaurs after that event. One of the problems, though, is we've investigated meteorite impacts and the surrounding soil is not enriched with iridium. The iridium remains in the impactor with very few exceptions. There may be one exception to that. On the other hand, volcanoes do produce iridium. But also iridium comes from volcanic eruptions. There's iridium throughout the fossil layers. It's just concentrated in certain layers. And I think those layers are when the sedimentation slowed down and a lot of iridium could fall at one particular depth before more came to bury it. And so we think lots of volcanic activity would have happened during the flood year, and so that would be more natural to interpret that as perhaps fallout for the late stages of the flood, perhaps. In any case, it's not consistent with the notion that an asteroid wiped out the dinosaurs. I think the whole basis of the theory is not very good, and the extinction of the dinosaurs is much more easily solved by a whole bunch of water called Noah's Flood. <laughs> It's also interesting to note that that's never really been the mainstream position. The folks who promoted the idea of an asteroid wiping out the dinosaurs, rather than submitting it to a scientific peer review, they actually went straight to the media with the idea and got a lot of people hyped up about it. And so you'll, you'll hear that position touted as if it were mainstream, but I'm not sure that it's ever really been the main folks that even the secular paleontologists uh, have believed. In addition to asteroids, there are fascinating pieces of ice flying around our solar system. They are comets, balls of ice and dust orbiting around the sun. Some we see every few decades, while others take longer to orbit. Where do they come from and how long do they last? Comets are small objects. They have a nucleus made of ices of various types and some dust and small solid particles thrown in. They're made up of various types of ice, not just water ice like we're used to, like you put in your Coca-Cola or whatever, but also other kinds of ice, things that, that would be gas on Earth but that are frozen, things like ammonia and methane and things of that nature. And all these things combined with basically particles of dirt. And we keep track of a couple hundred comets, actually, and there may be more than that. These are like big snowballs, several miles in diameter, a mixture of ice. And now when I say ice, I mean a collection of frozen chemicals, not just water, but dry ice and other things as well. And they're dirty snowballs. They also have dust and, and rock in them as well. They go on very long elliptical orbits. The sun's here and their orbits are like this. They're close to the sun at a point we call perihelion only once each orbit. They spend most of their time out here moving very slowly and they come in and move very quickly down here. Each comet has its own unique orbit, generally elliptical, some of them very thin ellipses, some of them a little wider, but they all have basically elliptical path. Sometimes that ellipse is enormous and it takes them way out beyond Neptune. And those ones you see them once and then that's it for your lifetime. It's interesting, comet Hale-Bopp, for example, has something like a 4,000 year period, which means it's orbited the sun once before. I got to see it back in 97 when it came around. It's a really beautiful comet. And based on my calculations, it's actually more than 4,000 years, but I did a little calculation and figured out that Noah probably saw that comet. Of course, we see them when they uh, approach our sun to the inner solar system. We don't see them when they're way out beyond Neptune, if they go that far. They spend most of their time in deep space where those particles remain frozen, but when they come close to the sun, you think, well, ice close to the sun, that can't be good, and you'd be right. The solar heat and radiation vaporizes sections of that ice. It goes directly from a solid to a vapor. There's insufficient pressure to have a liquid state, and it forms a sort of, kind of like an atmosphere around the comet, and it's called a coma, 
and you can see it from Earth. Once it gets that close, you can see it looks like a kind of a little fuzzball in space. Fun to see in a telescope. And then often the solar wind will press on those particles and it'll form a tail. And so a tail is actually material that's being blasted away from a comet. These things can be very bright, very spectacular, and in the past they were kind of scary. They're hard to predict. They can appear rather abruptly and then disappear. And they didn't follow the regular order of things in the solar system and in the world around them. They don't always do what we expect. There's no good way to predict how spectacular a comet will look as it comes by because it depends on the composition and things we don't always know very precisely. So astronomers often predict there'll be this spectacular comet this year and sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. They're a little bit unpredictable. Some of them have orbits that are not in the plane of the planets, interesting. Some will come in from above the solar system and then swing back out that way. So they're really unpredictable. Some people have said that comets are a bit like cats. They have tails and they do what they want. And I think that's probably a good way to describe them. We have understand them better in the 20th and now 21st century, and they have what they call the dirty ice or dirty snowball model, that these things are ices with a bunch of dust. Very, very frothy, very porous material, and they're very fragile. As I said, the nucleus is only a few miles across, so when it comes close to perihelion, it loses a significant amount of material each time. They lose 5 or 10 percent of their material every time they go around the sun, and they just don't stay in the solar system very long. Sometimes comets will interact with planets, particularly Jupiter, and it, sometimes Jupiter will change its orbit. It can either take a comet that's coming in that has a big orbit and convert it to a smaller orbit, or sometimes it'll take a comet and alter its orbit and eject it completely out of the solar system. So some comets are forever lost thanks to Jupiter. And on occasion one will slam into a planet, and that's always quite dramatic. I suspect comets are part of the original solar system that God created, and they're enjoyable, and they're one way that God declares His glory to us. One of the big challenges of evolution and our planet is the incredible amount of water we have. Where did it come from according to evolution? Could comets have brought it? Well, we're certainly the only planet that we know of with liquid water. Mars has some water. It has ice caps, which are a mixture of dry ice and water. But if you'd melt all that, yeah, you'd have quite a bit of water on Mars, not as much as the Earth has. The Moon has some moisture. But certainly the Earth is the only place that we have found so far that has liquid water and gaseous and solid, all three of them, and we need all three for our own health. It looks like we are especially blessed with water here. One of the speculations on why Earth has water is that it might have been delivered by comets. Because one component of comets is H2O, is water. And it's believed by many secular astronomers that when a comet hits the Earth, it releases its water onto the Earth's surface. And so the belief is that early on there are more comets, and the Earth's oceans uh, may have entirely come from comet impacts. That idea has become very popular in recent years. I think 20 years ago, very few people believed it. Now people, most people do. But there's a problem with that. There always is a problem with these secular ideas. You see, earth water has a certain ratio of deuterium in it, which is heavy hydrogen at one extra neutron. Comets have a different ratio of deuterium in their water. And so if earth water came from comets, it ought to have the same deuterium levels, but it doesn't. Also bothered me because you have Venus, which doesn't have liquid water. It's the same size as the earth, very similar orbit, just a little closer to the sun. If you know comets impact earth, they must have impacted Venus. Why wouldn't it have water also? But then others say, no, maybe that water came from the dust cloud, from the original nebula, or from here or there. It's not too well known, the oceans, if you depart from the creation account. And so I think the comets giving water to the Earth idea is dead on arrival for at least a couple of different reasons. The proposed evolutionary age of comets seemed to fall short of what the evidence shows. But what about the creation model? Do comets support the biblical age of the Earth of a few thousand years? And it's obvious that a comet can only survive passage by the sun a few times and it's gone. And so they don't last forever. In fact, every time they come around the sun, they're going to lose a few percent of their makeup. That's what the tail is streaming off behind. And they don't replenish themselves. They shrink. And sooner or later, they disappear. 
We've watched some comets disintegrate into just a spray of gas. We've watched a few comets uh, hit either a planet or uh, the sun and melt quickly that way. One way or the other, comets seem to be a temporary member of the solar system. Now, even Halley's Comet comes around about once a lifetime, every 75 years or so. One of these times of coming around is going to be gone or it's going to fall apart, and I'm sure it was quite a bit larger back at creation. If you think about it, that icy material is constantly being depleted. It can't do that forever. And we know the amount of material that's there. We know the rate at which it's being blasted away from the nucleus of the comet, the central icy source. And you do the calculation, comets can't last more than about 100,000 years maximum before they totally run out of material. So how could a solar system be 4.5 billion years old? It doesn't make sense. Comets should no longer exist. We still see them. So where are they coming from? And again, my secular colleagues said, well, there must be, you know, they've always got their rescuing device. There must be a mechanism that makes new comets. And so they've invented what they call an Oort cloud after the inventor, Jan Oort, who thought that maybe there is a big comet generator out there that makes new ones to replace the old ones. But we've never seen such a cloud and there's no evidence for it. Well, the suggestion from the deep time folks is that there must be way out beyond uh, Neptune and Pluto, uh, a vast store of comets. They have one called the Oort Comet Cloud. There's other clouds out there that have been speculated. Uh, we can't see them. They would be beyond telescopes anyway because these are small objects. And closer in is a kind of a donut shape, toroidal shape of uh, comet nuclei just beyond the orbit of Neptune. Called the Kuiper Belt, which is a flat ring of large chunks of ice that we see out there. Pluto, by the way, they think is just one of the larger members of this. And in either case, perturbations of the outer planets, little gravitational tweaks, or nearby stars or whatever coming by will cause these things to fall in to the inner solar system, where they will then replace ones that are dying. So you have a continual influx of comets to replace the old one. The Kuiper Belt theory doesn't seem to work when you actually put numbers to it, and nobody's ever seen it. The Kuiper Belt, they've discovered things beyond the orbit of Neptune, but I'm suspicious about a number of ways that I think this is just another asteroid belt. They don't seem to me to be comet nuclei. In the case of the Oort Cloud, there's not a bit of evidence to support that. There's a fantastic quote by Carl Sagan. There's not a shred of evidence to support its existence. Secular models for the solar system need there to be an Oort Cloud, this shell of cometary nuclei way out there in space, in order to explain the sources of certain comets. However, it's now turning out that the secular model, while requiring the Oort cloud to be there, can't actually make one. So comets, if they don't have that replenishment mechanism, would be very young. They would only be thousands to tens of thousands of years old for most of them. In order to explain the comets that we see today, the Oort cloud would need to have a certain number of comets. Secular modelers are now realizing that their models can produce less than 10% of those comets in the Oort cloud. And here's what they say. They say the sun was born in this cluster of hundreds of other stars and comets formed around all those other ones and then through gravity the sun, our sun, stole the comets from there. So more than 90% of our solar system's comets actually came from other solar systems. Now think about all the layers of assumptions that goes into a model like that. First of all, it requires the sun to have been born in this big cluster of hundreds of stars. Where are those companion stars today? We don't see them there. Second of all, why did the sun steal comets from other stars instead of those other stars stealing some of ours? I mean, gravity works both ways. Was there some sort of one-way comet valve in space? But this is what's being resorted to to explain away some major problems in the secular model. Yet the public is told that these models are science and that this is fact and that this is what we know happened. When what's actually going on when you dig into it is that there's all sorts of storytelling going on with some very contrived plots in the stories that don't match what we actually see. What we actually see is comets that the secular model can't explain. The evolutionary time requires this cloud. It's got to have it. It better be out there. But it's beyond seeing, so it's kind of an interesting model to have something to speculate, but it's beyond sight. Maybe time will uh, tell on this. Uh, maybe eventually they'll be able to narrow down and see that region on the fringe of the solar system to see if they're there or not. So that's kind of where that goes. At this stage, I would say comets are a young Earth indicator. 
But again, I wouldn't count it all that heavily because things may change. They may or may not find a cloud, but for now the burden is on evolutionists to show us this cloud. That's kind of what we say, where is it? The fact is there are comets. They're disappearing before our very eyes. Young Earth indicators. I think comets do suggest the solar system is far younger than billions of years. Comets are simply an indication of the youth of the solar system. As we think about asteroids and comets and how they tell us more about the creator's world, it reminds us of why creation astronomers continue their research. Some questions beget more questions, and so the search for answers makes explorers out of us all. We've learned a tremendous amount, but in a nutshell, we found out that the heavens declare the glory of God. I'm grateful to the space program just for all the details about the magnetic fields of the planets and the objects in the solar system. Those have, you know, really worked out for the glory of God. And I'm sure a lot of other creationists are grateful too because we know a lot about the geology of other planets. My friend John Baumgartner was really tickled when he found out that they were beginning to think that plate tectonics occurred on the planet Venus. And John says it looks like it was at the same time that it was happening on Earth during the Genesis Flood. We just had found out so much, and then the distant cosmos, we found out so much through the Hubble Space Telescope, and who can forget all those glorious pictures of things, they're just fabulously beautiful. I mean, if nothing else, it's like a trip through an art museum showing the glories of a particular painter showing how good and versatile he is. The more we find out about the intricacies of the physics and all the phenomena that have gone on in the past and are going on now, the more at least I marvel at how God put it all together. As we study asteroids and comets, it reminds us that God is in control and that He created great beauty and power in our solar system. It causes us to admire His creation and give Him praise because the heavens declare the glory of God. Mm -hmm.